Hello everyone, this is Neon. Welcome to Impromptu English with Neon. And today I'm going to do something educational again. And again, this is about research paper writing. So specifically, this video will cover paraphrasing and summarizing when writing a research paper. So we all know that when we want to cite someone, if it's a book, if it's an article, a newspaper, a website, whatever it is, we have to give them due credit. And the way we give proper citation, it's done in three ways. It can be done through paraphrasing, it can be done through summarizing, or we can directly quote them. So normally, quoting direct quotes aren't actually a good idea when writing a formal research paper. So that's why we should only use quotes very, very sparsely. Even if you don't use direct quotes at all, that's the safest option and I actually suggest you never to actually use direct quotes. There are some exceptions and I will co be covering them but this video will be a hands-on tutorial about how to paraphrase and summarize in research to avoid plagiarism. And also it's not only about avoiding plagiarism, it's when we are able to summarize and paraphrase something, it also signals the teacher and also yourself that you have understood the text and you can write it in your own words. So yeah, let's begin. So when should we summarize and when should we paraphrase? Is it our choice that we can choose whether to summarize or paraphrase a text depending on our liking? Well, no, actually, because these two terms have very significant differences. Most of you know that summarizing a text means shortening a large portion of a text. It can be a whole research paper of about 7,000, 8,000 words into a short summary. For example, it could be about 200 words, 250 words. Or it can also be a summary of a paragraph or two paragraphs which consist of say 300 words and then you are summarizing it into two to three sentences. So summarizing it can be either of that and it, it can be in the middle too. It's a spectrum. And also when we are summarizing we are only looking at the core details. We are not looking at every single detail, every single point that the whole text had and we are not uh, writing all of them down. On the other hand, in paraphrasing, we have to incorporate all the details of the text. So if the, if the original text had 300 words, our paraphrased text will also have more or less 300 words. It cannot have like 100 words or it cannot have 500 words. It has to be similar and it has to be of similar length. Let's now go through the steps of summarizing a research paper. As I said, a summary can just be a summary of one paragraph or two paragraphs or a section maybe, but it is also possible to summarize an entire research paper. So if we are to su summarize an entire research paper, we shouldn't obviously take in, we shouldn't obviously consider all the points made by the paper. That will be impractical because a paper can be about 8,000, 9,000 words. So these are the elements that we should look out for and that we should consider writing in our own research paper by citing them. First of all, the research purpose. Why was the research conducted in the first place? What was the incentive? What was the motive behind it? So we can write like this article uh, attempted to dash dash dash. So that would be the research purpose and would probably be relevant to our writing. Next, the setting, the time and place that the research was conducted. So was it a Bangladeshi study or was it in the context of Iran? Was it in the context of the USA? So that would probably be important as well. And next, methodology. How was the research conducted? Was it a quantitative research or was a qualitative approach taken? Maybe it was a mixed study how reliable was the methodology in the first place or maybe it the methodology section had some problems and then you are pointing it out that that research found this but there were some methodological problems which i will address so even then you can address this methodological feature of another article that which you cite but most importantly will be the findings so normally when we cite a research study we our main purpose is to show you is to show the reader 
what the findings or what the results of that study was so we can just sometimes even cite that this study or this author and that author found dot 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 and that would be the end of the summary it would just be a one line summary yes that is also possible you do not actually have to cover all of these five steps all of these five elements in a research paper summary you can sometimes even just cite the findings and that's it and sometimes you can also think if the suggestions if the recommendations made by the authors of that study if it's relevant like they suggested that further research could be undertaken in this area and then you are taking up that area you are filling that research gap then of course it's also very relevant and maybe there may be other reasons as well where the original authors suggestions or recommendations are important and that's why you are citing them but most importantly you have to cite the findings that they had I now want to show you all some sample summaries of research paper articles that I have done. So this word document is where I have summarized over 20 articles. So I've done this for a course where the topic was challenges of pair and group work for ELT students. So if you're interested in making a table like this, I highly recommend it if you are doing a big research project or your thesis. And if you're interested, I'll make a separate video about this inshallah. For now, just look at the highlighted parts. So this article was written by Suel Selik Korkmaz in the year 2017 in Turkey. He used mixed method. And this was the abstract. I copy pasted the abstract. This is the reference. And this is the summary of that entire article that I wrote in just about 50 words, in just 50 words. So let me read. Korkmaz 2017 found 14 advantages and 11 disadvantages of collaborative learning, which is pair work and group work. Secondly, a survey and an interview were administered to elaborate on the challenges of collaborative learning, with results showing that the challenges are extremely debilitative to the point of ruining friendships and unfair assessments. So I've written the, the elements of the of the summarizing our research paper of these five elements i have just incorporated findings and methodology here so these are obviously the findings the secondly firstly the advantages disadvantages and of course i also mentioned that a survey and an interview were administered so i also touched on the methodology so next here in this uh, in this article 2 in this article summary 2 i also used i wrote used a novel so and also and also mentioned to pique students interests in group work in the class so this was his research purpose so i've used both of them i'll not be reading the entire summary so let's read this one alfres 2017 conducted research on saudi arabian efl students perspective so here we see the context is given of group work in the classroom and also the research purpose is also given Perceived benefits of group work included the scaffolding that stronger students can give to weaker students, the fact that talking with fellow students is not as anxiety inducing, and an overall increase in motivation. On the other hand, the main challenge of group work was found to stem from unequal distribution of group members in terms of English proficiency level. Another perceived difficulty was found to be communication problems between group members. So see, I have incorporated three separate elements, setting, research purpose, and the findings. So here also the setting is given. So I don't always give it. When I think that it's necessary, then I signal it. And this is just a rough draft on a table. So when writing the research paper, if I feel like the setting or the methodology should be mentioned, I just mention it. So that's why I also made columns for this. For If I need it, I'll just put it here. So here it's also written a meta-analysis. So the, the methodology is also mentioned here. So let me scroll down. Okay, so here, even though this video is about paraphrasing and summarizing, you see that sometimes codes are also used. So this is, I think, a good time to tell you why sometimes codes are better. So let me read, Chaudhuri et al, et al means and others. 2018 investigated the challenges of integrating ICT into the curriculum at a public university. So the setting and the purpose is given. 
among many findings, one significant revelation was that there was, quote unquote, no scope of group work in the class. So see, it's a very extreme way to put a, the, put the statement, a researcher, an unbiased researcher cannot and should not say this like it's a very strong statement right so if if you are trying to cite something or if you're trying to say it, write something very controversial or it may not be too much controversial but and also the wording it's very direct so that time you should actually use quotes and also when you whenever you use quotes you have to give the page number if it's it was just a paraphrase or a summary no page number is needed so as you will see I haven't used page numbers in the other summaries there but since a quotation was used a direct quote so I had to use the page number as well and also if you think that the term is very uh, unique it's a very creative or innovative then you should also use quotation marks if you think it's relevant so let me scroll down one other thing I want to show you so yeah so about suggestion you'll see if, if you've noticed I haven't touched on su suggestion even though I've written about it here so sometimes you'll also think feel like the suggestion that the researcher gives it's also important for example Bari to 2020 advocates for CLL community language learning as the <coughs> language uh, teaching method in tertiary education in Bangladesh excuse me <coughs> So here, uh, it, this, is prob this is probably relevant if you also give a suggestion in your study or if you are writing about CLL in, in your group work, one of the things to overcome the challenges of group work, it could possibly be CLL. So if it's relevant to your research paper like it's relevant to mine, you can also uh, even cite some, another researcher's suggestion or recommendation. So let's now go back to the slides. So as I've said, paraphrasing is when we take all the points of the original text and we just write it in our own words. So there are a few techniques to doing this. Number one is active versus passive. We can simply turn the active sentence into a passive sentence or vice versa. For example, the sample sentence here in all these techniques that I'm using is bullying causes a significant amount of suicides so we can just simply turn it into a passive sentence a significant amount of suicides is caused by bullying very simple right so next we can also rearrange the text so when we talk about rearranging we it it may not only mean within the sentence here i'm just using the example of the same sentence but it can also be like you are paraphrasing a paragraph of about five sentences six sentences and in order to rearrange the sentence if you choose the rearranging technique you can start with the third sentence or the last sentence and then for one and then five and then six and then two so you can rearrange it if it makes sense so of course it has to make sense and it also can be used within the sentence for example you can write something that causes a significant amount of suicides is bullying okay so coming to synonyms before that you'll notice that the same keywords were used in these two techniques like bullying bullying is there significant amount of suicides is also there right here also so significant amount of suicides and then bullying so these words should also be changed because the plagiarism detector it may also detect that these are plagiarisms even if we have used one of the techniques so sometimes it's better to use synonyms for example bullying leads to a large quantity of suicides instead of saying significant amount of suicides you say large quantity of suicides but using synonyms too there is a lot of drawbacks to this as well for example let me actually show you if you wanted to write a synonym for bully for example you could have written persecuting or oppressing or tormenting okay so it makes sense in some respects but in this context here the word bullying is very important because it symbolizes a specific type of torment a specific type of oppression you cannot just say oppression leads to a large quantity of suicides yes it may make sense but it's not specific to bullying bullying is just one form of oppression it's just one form of tormenting okay so my advice is that you can combine as many as you can 
or just uh, you can combine two techniques or three techniques together in a sentence for example using the same example bullying causes a significant amount of suicides you can write something that causes a spike in the rate of suicide is bullying so you so you see i've used similar words it's not exactly a synonym but a similar word similar phrase spike in the rate of suicides something that causes so i've used rearranging technique and also synonyms again one thing that leads to a rise in suicides is bullying so instead of saying a spike in the rate i wrote leads to a rise and instead of causes i wrote leads thirdly bullying is something that results in a lot of suicides so you see instead of significant amount i wrote a lot of and instead of causes i wrote results and also uh, rearranged the sentence somewhat uh, finally, bullying has been found to be an important factor in leading to people taking their lives. So here I've actually even substituted the word suicides with people taking their lives. So it's not mandatory that you have to change every single sentence, every single word, especially the word bullying, you shouldn't change that. And also you, you may choose to live in the word suicides, but I felt like this is also a good way to paraphrase it. So now that you have seen the ways and the samples of paraphrasing, let me just show you some of the other samples that I have also paraphrased and then we are done. So let me now show you from a research paper that I have written about how I have paraphrased and summarized some texts. So here Suzuki and Kormos 2019 state that perceived fluency is affected more by speed and hesitations rather than repairs. So this is just one sentence that I've cited from Suzuki and Gormos for now. I've cited them again later on, but for now, I just cited one sentence. I didn't go into details. I didn't say how they conducted the research, where they conducted it, what was their purpose. I just mentioned one of their main findings. So as I've said earlier, you can simply cite some researchers, cite some articles just for one specific findings. That's okay. So next. Hesitations and pauses do not always signal a lack of proficiency as the IELTS International English Language Test IELTS rubric distinguishes between language related fluency and content related fluency. So I've actually talked about this in an earlier video of mine. Please check that out. So difficulty about topic instead of language. So this was distinguished by Jong 2018. Let me show you the actual article. So this was a meta analysis and here this part. They also wondered whether hesitations are either language or content related in the IELTS rubric. So here it's written in a different way. And even though language or content related hesitation, I've used these words. So I haven't paraphrased them because these are established words and Jong 2018 didn't just come up with them. And these uh, are there in other fields as well in other research papers as well and this is an established word and other than the terms language related fluency and content related fluency or hesitation I haven't used their word their sentence structure so that's all right moving on regarding pauses it was established in a meta-analysis so here I've mentioned that the methodological framework of that study of Suzuki et al study so here I mentioned this that only mid clause and end clause pauses significantly affect perceived fluency so another finding is there it's, it was because of this finding that I wrote this citation that I gave this citation and also I mentioned the meta analysis because I felt that it was important to state this in my research paper let's look at this so here this was this is suzuki at all's paper you can see shungo suzuki judith kormos and takumi uchihara so suzuki at all because more than two authors are there so this is how it was written in this paper pauses in the middle of in the middle of clauses have been found to be more strongly associated with perceived fluency than pauses at clause boundaries because pauses within clauses are hypothesized to reflect disruptions in l2 specific linguistic processing so how did i paraphrase this i just said i just wrote that regarding pauses it was established in a meta analysis that only mid clause and end clause pauses so these words these terms mid clause and end clause these were also used in this uh, in this paper but 
these are just terms like bullying so i don't think that it is required to uh, required to paraphrase them even if i did paraphrase them it would, would look odd and but besides that the sentence structure is completely different pauses significantly affect perceived fluency so you see uh, i also didn't uh, didn't bring in all the details that they mentioned so they also said that hypothesized to reflect disruptions in l2 specific linguistic processing i did not feel that it is necessary to put this point in my research paper so i just simply said about end clause pauses and middle clause pauses moving on sometimes what happened is that i sometimes cited one researcher or one research article this in this case it's for two authors and then i made a comment about it so it's my uh, it's my comment as the researcher as the researcher of this article it's it, it's not something that suzuki and kormos said let's read suzuki and kormos 2019 report that perceived fluency is often confused with grammatical com complexity and accuracy it's also a paraphrase it's not direct quote so i didn't give a page number and here, in other words, raters tend to conflate vocabulary and grammatical competence with fluency despite clear instructions of only focusing on fluency. So this sentence is my contribution. I clarified this point that Suzuki and Kormos made. And uh, when you're writing a literature review, it's important that you don't uh, only summarize or paraphrase. You should also comment. You should give a commentary on the findings, on the methodology, on the purpose of that research. If you feel like it needs clarification, if you feel like there is a hole, there was a hole in the research that, that, that there was a methodological flaw, you should point it out. Of course, you should do it respectfully, but it's your responsibility when writing a literature review. So here. The modern language teaching paradigm, especially in the fields of social linguistics and world Englishes, has moved away from the centrality of standard English and rather vouches for a pluricentric model. So I've cited Sridhar and Sridhar 2018. This is the article. So here one of their main findings was the pluricentricity of English. I read the entire article and I made notes, but I didn't use specific words or specific terms from this article because the main idea was that world Englishes that field had moved away from the singular centra centrality of English like there is no single sa standard rather all English varieties like Indian English American English Bangladesh English all are standard nothing is non-standard so uh, I wrote this and it's a complete pa summary I didn't paraphrase this I summarized it from that section this whole section the pluricentricity of English talks about this almost one pitch this means that native like pronunciation is no longer a goal according to language scholars this is also my own contribution this is one commentary that one comment that I made after making this after giving this citation and here I've added another citation another author citation however Isbel 2020 notes that pronunciation teaching is back in vogue so you see, I have actually used some quotes here, even though this video is about paraphrasing and summarizing, sometimes quoting is good. For example, this phrase is back in vogue. It's a very creative, it's a very catchy phrase, right? Wouldn't you agree? So that's why I felt that leaving it in would serve my paper better. It would look more attractive. And since it's a quotation, uh, it's a direct quote, I also had to give the page number. And another quote I also used in the same paragraph even, another Bangladeshi study by Anis and Monir, 2018, even goes so far as to say, quote unquote, pronunciation is the first step to learn any language. So you see here I quoted because it's a very catchy phrase. But here it's not so much as a catchy phrase, it's a controversial statement. Of course, I shouldn't as a researcher just write that some author said, pronunciation the first step or I shouldn't write pronunciation is the first step to learn any language I shouldn't also paraphrase it I should rather put it in the direct quote so that readers know that no it's not actually me who is spinning the language and paraphrasing it so some people may think like that but it's actually a direct quote by Anis and Monir okay 
So before concluding, I would like to show you some samples of what some of my friends and students have done, like the blunders they've done when trying to avoid plagiarism. So many of them actually thought that you can just avoid plagiarism by using direct quotes. If you just use the inverted comma, the quotation marks, then it's all right. But it's actually not the case. So first, this student starts out with a long quote. So this you can say is all right, it's acceptable because it's at the beginning and some writers do prefer to begin sometimes with a quote. It's sort of poetic and creative you can say. But see the second sentence, she begins with a long quote again. So here I would suggest her to paraphrase the quote. So here she gave the definition of a dialect from Penalosa. She can just paraphrase it. So moving on to another sample. So here this student what she did is she also gave long quotes. She wrote Gas and Selinker 20, 2008 say without getting rules in hand students learn through the samples and over generalizations. So here here it's not actually a catchy or a very controversial statement right. So she could just paraphrase it. For example, she could have written according to say, Gas and Selinker or Gas and Selinker say that without getting rules in hand, she could just write uh, before learning the rules or before knowing the rules, before having the rules in front of them, students learn through the samples and overgeneralizations. So students learn through templates. She so can use a synonym or just rearrange the sentence like samples and overgeneralizations could be used for st by students so something like that again Ortega 2013 does agree with them as she says usage based approaches explain language learning as by and large an implicit inductive task so here actually I think this is a very good sounding sentence because these words as by and large an implicit inductive task so this is quite a catchy sentence I think this can be kept there and it's also not very long. Here again Ellis 1993 describes grammar explanations can help particularly when followed by strategically sequenced exemplars that make hidden patterns more salient to learners. So here this part strategically sequenced exemplars I really like this part but the other part of the sentence I think that can be paraphrased. Let me try to do it now. Ellis 1993 describes um, instead of describes just write um, opined or just said to make it more to make it more simple to make it simpler said that something that can help or that can aid is grammar explanations or grammatic, grammatical rule explanations, right? And instead of particularly, you just write especially, especially when, and then this part you can actually quote because this is a very catchy sentence. It's a very catchy phrase when followed by strategically sequenced exemplars that make hidden patterns more salient to learners you can just write that for which highlight um, highlight to students the the hidden parts uh, hidden patterns instead of hidden patterns we can just write um, the required grammatical items so it's not a direct paraphrase the similar synonym of hidden but this is what was meant by the authors the uh, grammatical items that were that that are the <coughs> incentive the motive behind this task and so since it's the quotation mark will not be there because it's just in here and since also 
a quotation was used direct quotes was used were used even though it's not a full sentence you also have to give the page number so it's all right so you see this is known as embedded quotation or incorporating quotations within the sentence this is very good i love in embedded quotations and i think that embedded quotations also signal that you know how to uh, use sentences how to string together sentences that are also in one hand paraphrasing and also in another hand direct quoting and also quoting the very poetic or the very controversial terms so here the words clarify and negotiate these words were quoted by my student but i think language forms and grammatical structures these are not necessary to be quoted clarify and negotiate you can there is some credence to quoting them but not language forms and grammatical structures because these are not catchy terms or these are not innovative terms used by this author by these authors like bound and spada finally here it's written the teacher was about to establish learning scope and to activate intuitive heuristics yes this is a very good citation it's a very good direct quote because this is very catchy this is very innovative the way that celsi marcia brinton and snow wrote where teachers should provide enough data for learners to infer underlying grammatical rules but this part i think this part should be paraphrased all right so yes that's all that i wanted to talk about hope you've enjoyed hope you've learned something from this and yes i hope you stay with me on my journey to become more fluent in english bye bye assalamu alaikum